Let's open our Bibles and look at Colossians chapter 3, and I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 17. Verses 1 through 17. Okay, here we go. Since, the, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your heart hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Uh, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, uh, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, uh, in knowledge, in the image of its Creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised. And by the way, that's another way of saying Jewish or non-Jewish. Circumcised or uncircumcised. That's Jewish or not Jewish. Barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have taught us how to live. Lord, you have shown us who you are. You have shown us what to believe and then you have taught us how to live. Then please, Lord, help us to live this kind of life, the kind of life that pleases you and so that everything we do can be done in your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I love getting to the root of deep, theological uh, problems, or I love getting at um, very difficult Bible passages, passages to understand. I really enjoy uh, reading, say, uh, the Old Testament. Um, and the Old Testament, um, a lot of times you have to read very for a very long time. You have to read many, many chapters before you really start to understand what sort of religious and sort of political things are going on in the kingdom uh, of Israel at the time. Uh, I really enjoy looking at the, um, say, it's like learning the way that ancient people think, okay? So the, the Bible is, um, it is an ancient document, and the first people, the people who did the writing down, the, the first readers of it, they were all very ancient people, uh, and they thought in a very different way than, say, modern Americans do. Uh, and by the way, I don't want to call them, I don't want to just say it's ancient people, because there are people in the world today who still think uh, in the way that ancient Jews did or ancient Greeks did. Uh, so it's not exactly like they're just ancient, uncivilized, or um, unevolved people or something like that, okay? It's not like we're just on such a, a higher plane, but culture has changed, values have changed, um, but not all over the world. There are certain passages in the Bible that it just doesn't mean much to us because um, in our culture, in our day and age, it just, it just doesn't apply. But there are places in the world where just, just about everything in the Bible at some point really does apply. And I like getting to the root of those things and understanding uh, the world we live in, all the cultures, all the world views, and then the way that the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament all really speak to it, relate to it, and how some things that it seems like it's a very ancient thing, but it actually still does play out, play itself out in a, in a modern way. I love thinking about those things, and I love thinking, looking at the things that Paul says about the gospel and about the heresies that were going on in the first century. Um, you know, we've got plenty of theological con controversies going on and in the world today, in Christianity, it's nothing new. These theological controversies have been around for a very, very, very long time. They kind of cycle in and out of things, in fact. Um, 
But the very interesting thing, the very interesting thing to me is that after I get through with um, looking at these difficult Old Testament passages, or after I start uh, stop studying, or, or after I've kind of uh, got, come to a stopping place in my theological study on a, on a certain thing that Paul said, the next chapter, especially in Paul's writings, this is true, the next chapter, after he has rehashed the gospel, after he has gone through all the heresies, the very next chapter he'll start talking about the implications and the applications for what he's just talked about. And so remember, he's always he's been talking about some of the deepest, most complicated theological ideas, very groundbreaking, brand new worldview, and the, the implication for it in the next chapter almost always sounds like this. So be nice. Okay? Be nice to each other. All right? So like in, uh, in Colossians chapter 1 and 2, he lays out some very deep theological issues. And in chapter 3, what, what did that whole passage we just read, what did that sound like? It sounded like, so be nice. Uh, Romans, uh, Romans is probably the most difficult theological uh, writing ever written. It's probably the most complicated. And he gets through chapters 1 through 11, and it's all very deep. It's mind-blowing stuff. It's things that people dedicate their entire careers to. And then in chapter 12, he says, so be nice. So be nice to each other. Um, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 7 is a lot like that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 is like that. It all just comes back to, so in light of who God is, the most complicated uh, person you can ever think of, in light of all the things that he's done on the earth, what is the implication? Be nice. Be nice. Now, sometimes, as in, in Colossians chapter 3 here, he'll start out kind of with the converse, and he'll say, so don't be a jerk. Rather, be nice. Okay? And if you look at uh, uh, Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 5, uh, who does those kinds of things? Anger, rage, malice, slander, using people. Jerks do that. So, don't be a jerk. All right? Rather, a few verses later, rather, be nice. Okay? And it's very interesting that at the end of all things, what God really wants us to do is be nice. Now, it's not just be nice. Remember, what did he say? What were the two great commands? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you love your neighbor as yourself, what are you going to do? You're going to be nice. You're going to be very nice. And very interestingly, don't, do we really need to be told that? Are we so sinful? Are we so evil in our minds that we really have to be told to be nice? I mean, don't we all know these things? You children in here, and there aren't many children in here now, but you children in here, don't you know that it's better to share than to be selfish? Of course you know that. You teenagers in here, don't you know that it's better to be kind to people than to be a bully? Of course you know that. You 20-somethings in here, don't you know that it's better to give than to mooch? Of course you do. You 30-somethings, don't you know that it would be better for your, uh, with, for your relationship with your co-workers if you were kind, understanding, generous, and helpful in the workplace instead of being you know, really cutthroat and trying to climb the ladder and, and stabbing people in the back? Of course you know that. Of course you know to be nice. Uh, you 40-somethings, all right? Um, when you're at the, the soccer field watching your kids play soccer, don't you know it's, re it's better to be a very kind, positive, supportive cheerleader in the stands than to be uh, a pit bull with lipstick on? Okay, you remember that joke from a few years back? All right. Don't we know that kind of thing? Um, and you, uh, you who are in your 50s or beyond some things, okay? Don't you know that what people really uh, need from you is for you to be uh, the source of wisdom and the kind of caring person that a young person can go to when they uh, need your, your wisdom and experience? Isn't it better to be that? than to be uh, a grumpy old man that says, stay off my lawn. Don't we all know that it's better to be nice than not be nice? For you single people, don't you know that it's better to be honorable and chaste in your dating life than to be a, the kind of promiscuous person that hopes you don't run into about 20 different people when you go to the store? Of course. And you married people, don't you know that it's better to be honest and faithful to your spouse than to lie and be unfaithful and lose all trust? Of course you do. And you people who have even any little money in your pocket at all, don't you know that it's better to, for you to purchase the necessities of life for your family? 
than it is for you to waste it on the fantasy of winning the lottery? Of course you know those things. I think we all know the answer to all of these things. So why don't we do it? Why aren't we nice? In, in, in view of all things, in view of all this wisdom, in view of everything that, every, everything that God is and everything that He has done on the earth, why aren't we nice? We just have this problem. In the garden, Adam and Eve had this problem. They had one rule. They broke it. Now we have two rules. Believe in Jesus and be nice. And still, we just can't do it. And why? Why is it? Why can't we just be nice? Why can't we love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength? And why can't we love our neighbors as ourselves? And I think that the, the answer here is because uh, we view the world in the, through a wrong set of lenses. We see things in, a, in the incorrect way. Look at verses 1 through 4. and I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 again. And verses 1 through 4 really are the verses that set the tone for the whole rest of the chapter. Um, because he's going to say why, uh, why we don't why we aren't nice and then how we can start being nice and what, what the shift in our mind has to, that has to take place before we can do that. Look at verses 1 through 4 again. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated. Seated at the right hand of God. And that is probably the real key to it. Uh, when we're not focused on Christ, when we're not uh, setting our hearts on things above, and when we start setting our, our minds on earthly things, that's when the real problem starts. Because when we set our mind on earthly things, we get this desperation. We get this desperation because we know that all things are passing away. We know that there's a very real end to our lives coming. We know that there may be an end to the world coming or something like that. There, we are going to lose our chance to take and enjoy and, and have something for ourselves at some point. Therefore, we get greedy. We get selfish. And we, seek to, we seek to take everything we can for ourselves. We stop being nice. Why? Because we're looking at, uh, at, through our, at our lives and at the universe as if this earth and as if our hundred years or so is all that there is. And when you stop doing, when you live life that way, when you, and you become a desperate sinner like that, guess what? You're not going to be nice. But if you do set your mind on things above, if you do remember that this life is not all there is, when you remember that this place is not all there is, when you remember that you're an eternal being, especially in Christ, you're going to get to enjoy eternity as opposed to fear it, well, that'll change, your, uh, that'll change things. When you start looking as if, oh, if I don't get to do that now, don't worry, I've got eternity. If, if it's, I, I, I'm lonely now, I have to do everything I can to get rid of my loneliness now, um, then you're going to, you're going to, Use people, you're going to see people as something that can fill your void. But when you say, well, you know what? I can be lonely in this life. Why? Because I'm going to have eternity with Jesus. I'm going to have eternity with a whole group of people. I'm not going to be lonely forever. When you start setting your mind and your heart on things above, you'll find that it's a lot easier to be nice. When the earth is not all there is, for you, it'll be easier to put those things away. And when you miss an opportunity, when you lose a chance, it won't hurt quite as much. And you'll be able to look at people a little different way. You'll get to take off this one set of lenses, this, the lenses of sinful desperation. And you get to put on a, a different set of lenses. The lenses that the Christian puts on um, uh, should be different than the lenses that the world puts on. Um, you see, when you're walking around as a desperate sinner, and all of us have done that at some point, um, let's say your, your biggest sin is some kind of sexual temptation. If you're walking around with those kinds of lenses on, what do you, what do, you do? You walk around seeing uh, people that you could take from or don't want to take from. Okay? Yes, I want. No, I don't want. All right? And it's not their heart and soul and the beauty of the person that they are. No, that's not what it is. You go around saying, who can I take from? Who can I not take from? If you walk down the street 
um, as a person who is a, an extreme taker in this world, you only see other people as sources, sources of money, sources of drugs, sources of um, I don't know, what kind of, whether affirmation you need or something like that. And you'll say, what can I take from this person or that person or the other person? If you're an extremely critical person, all you do is walk around seeing the flaw in everything, whether it's a building or another person or an institution. And of course, you know that there are flaws in yourself and you're very critical of those, but uh, you also have to tear down everything else. You look around saying, why doesn't somebody fix that? Or this is what that person ought to do. Or this is what that business ought to do. Or why don't we just put that person out of their misery? Which is probably more like, why don't we put that person out of my misery? Something like that. God looks at the world um, in a similar way. He looks around and he sees people and he knows who they are, what they're capable of. He knows all the disrepair in their lives. He sees all the brokenness as well, but with very different intentions. He sees people with the intention of fixing what is wrong. He sees every situation, every home, every workplace, every school, every town, every country as a place where the kingdom of God needs to come in. And that is what I want us to think about a little bit this morning. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is what? Is this, it's not just heaven where we will spend eternity. When Jesus was uh, walking ar around on this earth some 2,000 years ago, he was saying, the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of heaven is coming. And it's coming now. And he said people won't pass away until they see it. The kingdom of heaven is coming. So what is that? It's whenever God invades a place and sets something right. When God invades a place and sets something right, the kingdom of God has come. I'd like to give you a pretty extreme example to, um, uh, to illustrate this. I was listening to a missionary speak several years ago, and he was talking about um, missional living. And he was talking about basically missionaries going into a place and bringing the kingdom of heaven there. Okay? Uh, and he said, I met a pastor in Cambodia. He was in Cambodia giving a, um, doing a sort of a seminar, and he met this young pastor. And this pastor looked very different from any of the other pastors around. He said, I want to go meet this guy. He, just, the, he, he, looks, he dresses different, he talks different, he acts different. There's something different about this guy. So he said, I'd like to hear it. He just went up to the guy and said, I'd like to hear who you are uh, and where you're from, how long you've been a Christian, and what kind of ministry you're involved in. And this, is, this was the guy's testimony. He said, I was a smuggler before I became a Christian. He said, I, uh, I was on the run for my life one time, and the police were going to, they were going to get me, they were going to kill me. But he, he found a small village in the jungle of Cambodia where basically the whole village was Christian. And they took him in and hid him and sort of, and fed him, took care of him, and he shared, they shared the gospel with him. And he became a Christian. And after he left that village, he went to a Bible college. And he went to this Bible college and said, I've got to have training. I've, I've got this new faith. I want to know what I believe and, and, and everything about, about the Bible. And so he went to Bible college for however many years. It might have just been a, a two-year thing or something like that. And when he came out, he started looking for churches. But he's not exactly the nice washed and polished type of preacher that most churches wanted. Uh, so he found it very hard to find a church. He found it very hard to find any kind of employment in Christian service. And he was very discouraged about that one day, and he was sitting in a coffee shop wondering what God was doing with him. And this coffee shop was on a river right there in the capital, and across the river there was a shanty town. And that day, while he was sitting there, government trucks pulled up, and they announced... Uh, a hotel is going to be built here on this piece of ground. You've got 30 minutes to get all of your stuff and get out of here. The bulldozers will be here in an hour. So there's thousands of people in this shanty town right there on the bank of this river. And all of a sudden, they got to go. Now, it's not like they have very much, but what they have, they value. And big army deuce and a half trucks came up to load them all up and take them somewhere. And they don't even know where. So they all got their stuff and got on the truck and they started pulling out. And as he was watching all of this happen, 
The Spirit just really moved in the guy and, and the Lord seemed to say to him, there's your church. Whoa. So he got on his scooter. In Southeast Asia, everybody rides scooters. So he got on his scooter. And he started following the big deuce and a half trucks. And they took them to a place out by the airport. And out by the airport, there was this swamp. And in the, in the wet season, it was water up to your knees. In the dry season, it was water up to your ankles. And they dropped them off there. Oh my. This is these people's new reality. This is their life now. Their, uh, the shanty town, the, the place that they didn't own that property or anything. Um, but they had been living there for a while. They'd been trying to make a life there for a while. Then all of a sudden, they're just picked up and moved to a worse place. All right? These little shanty towns in Southeast Asia, I'm telling you, they're, they're not good places. But it's paradise compared to what they were dumped into. And so here's this young pastor following them, seeing where they are, and the Lord moving on him to say, there's your church. So he went in with them basically and said, all right, what can we do here? What can we do here? And this is the thought that went through his mind. Everything you see here that's not in accordance with the kingdom of God, you need to change it. Okay? So in, uh, in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven, do people live in a swamp where there's water up to your ankles in the dry season and water up to your knees in the, uh, uh, in the wet season? No, there's not. So he begins organizing people uh, and getting these shovels, makeshift shovels or whatever, and they start digging channels to start to trying to drain the water out. Try to, way to, try to find a way to drain the water out. And when things got a little bit drier, they could start setting up this newer shanty town. And then after that, the guy even brings his wife and child to live with them uh, right there in the shanty town, in the swamp, because you cannot minister to people if you don't live near them, if you don't live by them. Because in the kingdom of heaven, is God far away? Does he live far away and then come to see us in our misery uh, once a week uh, and then go back to his nice palace? No, he lives right here with us. And then the guy started to notice, well, okay, nobody, no child here is getting any kind of an education. What do we do? In the kingdom of heaven, are people illiterate and ignorant? Of course not. So he started uh, twisting arms. He started going back to all the, all the pastors that he graduated college uh, Bible college with and all the churches that they were from trying to twist arms to get people to bring teachers and doctors and dentists and whoever else they can out there because these people are living in uh, in the kingdom of hell and I'm trying to bring the kingdom of heaven to these people and little by little over months and years he changes lives and he earns the right to share the gospel and guess what? He's got a church. He was nice. And he got a church. The government saw pathetic lives with no rights because their eyes were fixed on the earthly things, the very temporary wealth that they could get from having uh, a hotel on this, the bank of this river. But this young pastor saw through the lens of God and he saw people who were a sheep, who were sheep without a shepherd, and he didn't use them and he didn't cheat them and he didn't slander them and he didn't make them feel worthless. He didn't make them feel as though they were other. And in the name of the Lord, he began bringing the kingdom of heaven to the place where they lived. He was nice to them. So for you, I want you to be nice. I want you to put on a different kind of lenses. And I want you to walk through the world as you go throughout the world, go throughout uh, your town, your, your everyday life. And I want you to see people differently. I don't want you to see people as targets and sources of things that you can get something from. I want you to see lives that need the kingdom of heaven brought into them. I, I want you to see people who need the touch of Jesus and so in your home, if your home is not like the kingdom of heaven, then ask yourself, what would a home in the kingdom of heaven look like? And I want you to start being that in your home. Start doing those things in your home. And in your workplace, if, if you look at your workplace and you say, well, the kingdom of heaven surely is not going to be like this place. 
Well, then what would it be like? And start praying and asking for God to give you wisdom to know how to implement the kingdom of God at your workplace, at your school, at whatever civic organization that you're in. If the kingdom of God is not visible in a place around you, put on the lenses of God and see everybody with compassion. Try to bring the kingdom of God into that place and be nice. And in the end, maybe our church uh, will not be seen as having an us and them mentality. In that, in that passage where it talks about circumcision and uncircumcision, slave and free, barbarian and Scythian, what it's really talking about is a separation due to uh, either ethnicity or religion or whatever. Whatever barrier there is. It's an us and them thing. And if we, are, if we start being nice... And if we start bringing the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven into every place we go, then we will break down those, what the Bible also calls the walls of hostility between us and people and between God and people. We need to be a church who sees God for who he is, the great redeemer and the great reconciler. We need to not see people as those we can take from, but those that we can offer something to, especially offer Christ. To. We need to be known as a church that redeems the reputation of churches in our community. We need to be known as a church that fights for the right, um, the right things, fights for the right things, and in the right way. Because you can do the right thing in the wrong way, can't you? We need to be known, um, we need to be a church that goes out from among them. As something the Bible talks about is being different from the world, even as we walk to them. Come out from among them and while we're walking to them. And that is a very strange paradox. But it's the idea of not living like the world as we're walking into the world among people. We need to shun the ways of the world, but embrace the hurting people of the world all at the same time. We need to be nice. With the wonders of God and the mysteries of Christ and all of that deep theology moving us. Uh, and, and inspiring us, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus and go out and love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and love our neighbors as ourselves. Let me end with this benediction and then we'll have a uh, closing prayer for our fellowship meal and then we'll go eat together. Uh, but go ahead and stand and receive this blessing. This comes from the passage that we just read. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity today to worship you freely and to praise your name together. And we thank you for the meal that we are about to share. Bless our fellowship while we eat. In Jesus' name, amen.